real quick. Um, we are recording tonight's event. So if you don't want to be on the recording, feel free. If you'd like to silence your camera, that's one option. I'll also say if you're not actively speaking, um, you're not normally included on the recording. I get this question a lot. We do upload these to our YouTube channel. It normally takes a day or so, but if you have anybody that wanted to be here today and couldn't, um, feel free to direct them to Papa's YouTube channel um, to see, see this again. Other than that, um, I do want to mention, like I said, this is discussion based. Brittany and Jody have an amazing PowerPoint full of images from our collection they're going to be showing you. Um, I'd recommend go ahead and pinning either Jody or Brittany. That way you don't lose them in the crowd. So I'm going to actually unmute both of you to say hi real quick. I don't want to wave and say hello. Hi. So if you click on um, Jody's square or Brittany's square, there's three little dots. And when you click on that, there's a drop down menu and you can click to pin one or the other. The other thing I'm going to mention is normally I recommend you keep your screen and speaker view the whole event, um, or at least the first half. If you don't want to do that, um, when we do share the screen, we are going to ask, you can actually expand the view that you see folks. So you can see more squares um, when we do that share screen option. Um, and so when we do that, it might be a little easier to talk about, but just know that um, if you have trouble seeing Brittany or Jody, you can always use the arrows on the side of the screen to find them once we're in the call. So I think that's plenty of me talking today. Um, it's now my pleasure to hand you over to our speakers. We've got Curator of Contemporary Art, Jody Frockmorton, and Curator of the John Roden Collection, Dr. Brittany Webb. So welcome to both of you. Thank you all so much for being here. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having us. Um, I think that this is this should be a fun conversation. I think we've all been thinking and talking about masks a lot lately. <laughs> um, so getting to look at um, like different ways, artful ways to think about covering by looking at some work in the collection and just thinking and talking about what we're all doing, what artists are doing, uh, should be pretty fun. Jody. Well, uh, one of the one of the the really great things I think about tonight is that well we have a lot of artists on the call, which so we're expecting a lot out of all of you. Just want to let you know that. But we have two uh, really special people, um, Humera Abid and Theodore Harris, who uh, we we have their work in the collection happily, and we're going to talk a little bit about it, but also invite them to say a few words. So I really want to thank you two for being here and taking the time to to do this with us tonight. So it'll be great to hear from you. Yeah, so I will start. Okay, okay. All right. Um, so uh, we want to start by just thanking all the participants, especially members, uh, for showing up to programs. Uh, PAFA's audience has been really present um, and incredibly participatory in the in the few weeks that we've been self-isolating uh, during COVID-19, um, and even for folks who are not self-isolating but are dropping in in between all kinds of work responsibilities just to replenish themselves with a little bit of art. Um, it's it's a huge, it's, it's hugely appreciated on our part. Um, and so this is also the membership pitch. If you're not a member at the moment, uh, please consider joining. It just, um, it gives you a little bit more input and, and we like to see who's showing up often. If you've been on two or three programs, just consider going ahead and getting a membership and, and, and speaking with us more. Um, but I, I think that we, you know, we thought we would start with this uh, great recent acquisition uh, to PAFA's collection, um, a work by Stephanie Sajuko from the Cargo Cult series to start thinking about masking. Um, so in this moment where we are being asked by public health officials to wear masks when we go out in public, it, out of consideration for our own health and the health of others, um, we were thinking about how is that a jumping off point for thinking about all of the ways that humans have worn masks for all sorts of reasons. What are the social implications of masks? How do they signal visually in public? You know, what do they mean when we see people out in the world wearing, wearing masks? Um, that there are instances where we um, are in places where everyone is wearing a mask for some reason or another, um, and it, it isn't necessarily an index of separation. Sometimes it's about community building. Um, and so this is an image from the permanent collection, which is absolutely in that conversation. 
Um, and I want to invite Jody to talk about why, first, how, how she came across this image and how she acquired it, actually, for PAFA's permanent collection. Yeah, Stephanie, um, Stephanie's, Stephanie's work is actually perfect for this time in so many different ways. And I really recommend that after we're, after we're all done, um, please, you know, Google her and check out her other work. Um, but this is part, this is part, as Brittany said, of part of a series of work that she did called Cargo Cults. And it's one of four images from the series that we have at PAFA. So also go online and check out the other, the other images that we, we have by Stephanie from this series. Um, but as you can see in the image, she's pulling from these historical ethnographic studio portraits or this idea of studio portraiture. So one of the ways that I've been thinking about it is certainly about as we think about the ways that the, the West continues to stereotype um, other countries, if you think about contemporary, the, the, the sort of the reach of Orientalism into the contemporary, for example, this is certainly one of the things that Stephanie's dealing with in her, in her, um, in her images. Um, and if we want to bring this into the current moment, I couldn't help but think about the, the, the xenophobic attacks that have been happening again and again. And some of it really at the beginning was about wearing masks. When, when people, people, you know, Asian Americans, for example, wearing masks were being attacked. Um, so, so, but what she's doing is she has been, for this series, she went out and she bought mass made clothing at stores that we, maybe we all, maybe we all don't shop at, but Forever 21, H&M, those stores of fast fashion, for example. But she was particularly looking for patterns that were in some way supposed to make a quote unquote ethnic reference. So a way of, again, fast fashion, um, taking advantage of these, of these cultural touchstones. Um, she bought them with her credit card. She did these photo shoots and then she returned them all for, for a full refund, which is actually incredibly important in Stephanie's work that she wasn't contributing to this cycle of commercialism um, that, she was, that she was buying for this um, or that she was using in these photo, photos. And if you look closely at some of them, I'm not sure if in this, in this image exactly, but sometimes you can see tags that say H&M or Forever 21, for example. Uh, the other part of this that actually is related to masking in a different way is the idea of dazzle camouflage. Have many of you heard of dazzle camouflage from World War I? It was that really graphic patterning, patterning that um, the black and white that they would put on ships in World War I to, to confuse the enemy, which I think is, a, is an interesting moment when you think right now, when you think about ideas of masking and hiding and confusing. Um, What's interesting also is that, and I have one right here, is that Stephanie's been making masks. So they're amazing. Um, she was doing them at first for frontline workers that um, were not part of the medical field. She talks a lot about how there's this, um, her work talks a lot about invisible labor. So those workers that are deemed essential, but maybe aren't getting as much attention in the media, for example, grocery store workers, that type of thing. Um, but she's also has some available on Open Editions, which is a Bay Area based um, artist edition, edition um, place that you can buy and then they'll, they'll also donate masks. Um, but one of the things that I think is amazing is that Stephanie's always a, uh, there's a there's definitely activism as part of her work and one of the things that that I think we've all been talking about is surveillance right um, we've seen it rolled out in in other countries where you'll be able to get a read on someone's temperature through video and, and that type of thing well one of the things that that they found is this dazzle camouflage and it may be a specific configuration of it actually confuses uh, video surveillance so um, I think I saw Stephanie say on Instagram or Facebook or something like, so, so when the revolution happens, we'll be ready for our masks, which is, with our masks, which is something that, um, that Brittany, I have definitely talked about, about with, uh, with, with, some of these, with some of these works coming up, this idea of um, protection um, and protest as well. That's part of, that's part of what mask making. Yeah, mask and I thought that, I thought that um, one of the things that's great about this image um, and part of how it ends up a signature image for this conversation is that, um, you know, early in the, you know, in the early days of our national conversation around the pandemic that you had a kind of xenophobia around um, Asian Americans wearing masks because this isn't a part of the world where people are wearing masks all the time. And so there was a way that the mask was really ethnicized um, in our sort of like cultural memory. Um, but 
there are all kinds of like masking and covering that get tied to our ideas around how they signal ethnicity or how they signal um, religion or spiritual practice um, in some really particular ways. You know, the even to call this the cargo cult series, which um, really a lot of the literature that comes out of anthropology, uh, which is my home discipline, um, about a belief about the, the kinds of like the, the spirituality around where abundance comes from. Um, I thought, you know, wow, what a great sort of jumping off point for us to talk about all the ways that we can see how art is an especially um, fruitful field to look at for how people have thought about, depicted, um, worked with, sort of conjured masks and, and covering as a, as a signal for all kinds of things that are culturally important to us. Um, and so, you know, it's not just contemporary artists. This has a really long history. So we have this uh, life mask of Abraham Lincoln from the permanent collection by Leonard Volk. And I thought, um, you know, looking historically at art, there's, there's a long tradition of artists working with masks and life and death masks are, are, are uh, an early art historical practice. Um, so I was talking earlier with, uh, a call, my colleague Anna Marley, who's on this call, we were thinking about, um, you know, historic mass in the collections. And for people who don't necessarily know, it, it was an early, um, like a 19th century practice to take masks of different people, like a life mask was a kind of a commemorative portrait, a way to capture their face in sculpture, um, while death masks sort of have a function of a kind of, it's almost like, um, like like a forensic science function, you know, we don't we tend not to take uh, facial uh, plaster casts or um, bronze casts of, of of dead people anymore now that we have forensic te technology. Um, but Jody and I were talking about how creepy it is that to to think about you know what what forensic photography does now for capturing the the visuality of the dead. Um, sort of like in morgues, how photography is somehow more creepy than sculpture because of a kind of the realistic depiction. But the 3D version of a mask of somebody either alive or dead, it's so tactile that it does something else for us. Um, it's also sort of interesting to see this mask of Abraham Lincoln that is like clearly, you know, before he was president. So we're used to seeing Lincoln with a lot of facial hair in the hat. Um, and this is like very early in American history. So it's before the old Lincoln that we're used to. Um, and Jody, didn't you say there was a contemporary artist that was doing something with this project around like the 3D printing? Yeah, uh, a Philadelphia artist that some of you may know, Lewis Colburn. Um, he's, you, if, if I'm getting this correct, and, and I should have double checked with Lewis before, before our talk, but you can actually go online and find a, a file of the life mask of Abraham Lincoln, um, and you can download it upload it, download it, I think it's download it, and uh, print your own via your 3D printer. So it's an interesting uh, moment of technology translation, I think, when we can actually print, print the face of a president, um, which, I, which I think is, is, interest, is, is fascinating. I mean, the other thing, Brittany, that I, that I think um, might be an interesting, maybe people have comments on as, as well, is um, I think we're all thinking about how to memorialize people um, and, and I, you know, we've been talking a lot about portraiture and things, but, but these, these life masks, even though this, this one is from life, we think of death masks as well as a way of, of memorializing and a way of, of, of touching in some way those, that have, those that, that have gone on. Yeah, I also sort of like the kind of uh, continuity with the kind of artists dealing with life and death masks. Um, also thinking with artists dealing with like the tragedy comedy mask trope um, that that is like a through line art historically that you see in a lot of works. Um, and so I also, I just think that this is like a really lovely Calder sculpture. Um, this is um, Alexander Sterling Calder's uh, work. And so that if you are thinking of Alexander Calder, um, who creates so many of the mobile sculptures that you see all over Philadelphia, um, this would be his father. Um, there are three Alexander Calders. It's, uh, they're all named after one another. It's um, it can get a little confusing for people. Um, but I thought it was really fascinating uh, to think about, you know, how are artists thinking about masks and covering? Um, how are artists thinking about masks as a trope? Um, this is a trope that's really like, dealing with the comedy and the tragedy of life. And this also feels like a moment to think about, you know, 
what what are what are some ways to think about masks, life and death, comedy and tragedy? I feel like there's a lot of that at this moment. Um, we're having a lot of artful conversations around all of that right now. Um, and it's just fun to think with through some art. Um, and so we have Theodore Harris, I believe, with us on the call uh, to maybe offer some insights into his piece, Veto Dreams, which also features a young boy wearing a mask um, with, you know, and this piece is a mixed media collage that also features the Capitol building upside down. Um, so Theodore, I'd love if you could share a few words about the piece. You should be, I'm trying to unmute you. There you go. Okay. Hey, hello everybody. Hi, Brittany. Hi. <laughs> um, so um, I wrote a few notes about the piece really quickly. Um, so this piece is made up of about two images, the, the boy in the foreground in the Capitol building and that red stripe to the left. When I found the image of the Capitol building, of course, it was right side up. And so the red stripe would, would have been on the right side. When I found the image of the, the, the young boy, he was standing on a pile of bodies in Rwanda, which is why he has that makeshift mask on because of the stench from the bodies. So I cut the, cut, uh, the image of him out standing in that landscape of bodies um, and found this image of the Capitol and turned it upside down, placed the boy sort of off center. And that's when I, that's when I knew the, the piece was complete. Then I glued it down. But that red stripe on the center was too, too um, it needed something. So I, this is early in the collages where I would tear I would like t torn images and straight images, hard edges and soft edges or rigid edges. So I tore the, some of the red off and stuck the black color back there to give it more depth of space. And um, so it's really about two or three images this piece is made up of. So um, yeah, I think that's basically it. One interesting story. So this piece was done in 1995. Um, so this was a, like a, I think it was like a year after the Rwandan genocide, which was in the, in the 19, around 1994. Um, Leroy Johnson and I, this was way after the piece was done. We had a, a two person exhibit at um, Penn State, the main campus. And uh, we were with the curator and Shields in the um, having dinner. And across from us was sitting Paul Resabegine, the man who became well known in the Rwanda genocide in Hotel Rwanda, the man who um, protected all those people from the slaughter outside. He was in the same dining room as us. And I went over and I talked to him and he came over and he had dinner with us. And so we, it was, that was really something. But yeah, that's, so that piece um, has um, had a lot of, um, has been around. It's been around, it's been published on a lot of covers of books, been used in uh, Rennie Harris, Pure Movement, the choreographer Rennie Harris, been used in his um, touring um, company's work called Facing Mecca, is used as a set design projection and that. So it's got a lot of, had a lot of um, exposure. But now people are using it to talk about our current condition now. When, when, um, when Trump got in office, people were using it then to say, hey, this is perfect for what's going on. And then now people are referencing it for this situation. Could you talk, I think when, when, when we acquired the Peace Theater, I don't think I ever yeah. asked you about the title specifically, Vito Dreams. Yes. Yeah, I forgot to mention that, thanks. Um, so I could not think of a title for it. So I had uh, the artist, John Abner, who's a great collagist. Um, he asked, asked John, I said, can you give me a title for this? He right away said, Vito Dreams. And he titled a few other pieces of mine too. But it was the perfect title because a lot of people say that is the White House, but it's the Capitol building where the laws are passed and vetoed and 
and stuff like that. So it was the perfect title for it. Yeah, I think that there's a surprising resonance in this moment. You know, the the two things that jumped out to me um, thinking about the image for this talk, the work for this talk is the way, um, you know, I, I can remember when um, all of the the journalism around, you know, if you don't have a mask, you can make a mask very easily and here's how. That there were all sorts of mask making tutorials <laughs> right. that were kind of, you can make a mask with a scarf, right. you can make a mask with a sock. Right. Um, that involved, a, if you have a string or a rubber band or a hair tie, um, you fold the fabric in this way and secure it to your, to your face in this fashion. Mm -hmm. um, as a kind of, like there was a there was a moment where it seemed so strange to see all these tutorials, um, and then of course a moment to consider that the reason there are millions of people in the world who know how to do this is because there have been millions of people in the world who have needed at some point or another to do this. Um, exactly. And while right now it's a you know it's a the 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 impetus is public health. Um, you know, yeah. there have been lots of other reasons, even just the, you know, to, to mask, in, you know, for lack of a better word, uh, the surrounding smell. Um, but also yeah. to have the image of the Capitol building upside down in a moment where such a huge part of the health crisis is the, the crisis of information, um, both the, the political information that's at odds with the health information and the, yes. and the kind of the management of yes. the apparatuses, you know, thinking about what public health officials in elite universities and scientific institutions are saying versus what right. the city and state level um, scientists are saying versus what you're hearing from the CDC and the federal government, that there's a kind of grappling with how do we manage our health in this moment? How do we manage the politics of health in this moment? How are the politicians managing us in this moment? Um, right. The fact that so many of us who are self-isolating are doing so because um, municipal leaders have, have um, mandated that, but depending on where you are, that's, that's sort of in flux. Um, this feels like such a, such a hallmark of, um, if any piece in the collection that featured a mask uh, spoke to this moment, it would be this one. Mm, mm. Yeah, I was thinking about before the talk, this, uh, this sort of uh, what you exactly what you're saying is that gulf in between the boy's head and the Capitol building and that gulf of between those two, which is a sort of social distancing that we have with our relationship to this, this administration. You know, it's sort of social distancing from us and us from them because of the rhetoric and the, you know, outright racism that is being spewed and the, inf the misinformation, which is astounding that, you know, and really tragic that we have to go through this and have to live under this. So yeah, so that gulf in between the capital and that boy's head is that social distancing. Yeah, I think I'd like us to come back to this after we think about a few more works because I think that yeah. there's there's a couple of impulses that we have around um, how we think and talk about masks and visuality right now. Um, we all are sort of uh, itching to get past this moment of needing to wear them. Um, and at the same time, I think uh, those of us who think about the visual and about the artistic a lot um, are also wanting to be really creative and expansive about uh, what's useful about masks. Um, maybe we can take some inspiration from artists on this. Um, and so I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit fast now so we can get to like a larger conversation. Um, but um, we really liked thinking with this Ooh. Betty are uh, made right mask eyes piece because it's a, uh, um, it's a piece that came into the permanent collection through um, a gift from Linda Lee Alter, and it's a washboard that features um, uh, Betty Sarr using African masks, like very, very small African masks. I, I don't think you can see the detail. Um, incorporated into the figure of an Aunt Jemima. And so she's thinking about race and stereotypes um, and how faces and masks have shown up and how African masks in particular have been part of that conversation. 
Um, and if you, for those who can't read super clearly, um, around the central figure on the washboard, the text reads, they carved Europe upon our African masks and made puppets. And this feels like a very clear critique of uh, modernism's apprehension of Africa and African masks and the visuality of a lot of art from African nations overall serving as a kind of influence on the contemporary, the art the contemporary art that made up modernist movements, um, but the refusal to let African art stand as art on its own, um, to stand as anything other than an inspiration or a fossil. Um, and so it's kind of interesting to think about the ways that contemporary artists that are interested in African mass, they're interested in diaspora, reclaim African mass in their work as a kind of pushback against that early modernist impulse um, to treat it only as an inspiration and a fossil. Um, and there's a similar kind of work happening in David Driscoll's Dance of the Mask. Um, uh, David Driscoll, who we recently lost to the coronavirus, uh, incorporated the African mask into this work in a way that I think is really similar. There's a kind of intentional um, infusion into the contemporary, whether that's through materiality in both uh, Saar and Driscoll's work, both the, you know, wanting to pull materials together, wanting to pull visual motifs together, wanting to have a conversation around a, as a kind of, uh, we have always been modern. I'm thinking with, there's a um, huge theoretical text called We Have Never Been Modern um, that uh, was really big in my field, I think in the 90s, and there was a lot of pushback around, well, there are certain people in the world who actually have always been modern, if you have thought about the ways that modernity has left people out intentionally, um, we can acknowledge that as a way to bring people back in. Um, and then, so, you know, in thinking about the what masks uh, conceal. Uh, we also like thinking with this, another recent acquisition uh, to the collection by Humera Abid about what masks reveal and what they do allow us to see. And this Tempting Eyes series is like a perfect example of this uh, because this is sort of in contrast to the Stephanie Sejuko figure where you are looking at a woman whose entire body is covered except for her eyes. Here we have a spotlight on the eyes. And just to orient you before we kick it off to Humera, is that these are hand carved wooden uh, mirrors, car mirrors. So they're all hand carved by, by Humera. And that these are all hand painted images. So what you're seeing in the images are, are paintings inside these mirrors. And, and one of the things that I've been thinking about is, is the, I mean, this, this piece is so incredibly rich in a lot of different ways, Humera, but, but one of the things I've been thinking about in recent times is now the way that, that we communicate with our eyes. Um, how do we walk down the street and have those communications with our neighbors or with people we don't even know without being able to smile to each other? And um, it's such an interesting thing because a lot of this piece, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, came from this idea that uh, there was almost a law in Saudi Arabia where they were saying that women couldn't have tempting eyes. However, we want to define tempting eyes. That's correct. Uh, there is actually, uh, in Saudi Arabia, there are two kind of laws. One is the regular for the country. One is uh, religious law. So this comes mm -hmm. under religious law. So it was passed a few years back uh, because eyes are the only part that women show can show. Uh, and they actually, if you know, uh, especially Arab women, they make really pretty eyes, like a very nice liner and really pretty eyes. And they have very pretty eyes. So they ended up passing a law that if they make their eyes really pretty, if they become very tempting, they can be charged for that. And you can read about that online. It's called Tempting Eyes Law. That's how my work got that title, Tempting Eyes. Um, and also, uh, I mean, just recently, the law was passed in Saudi Arabia that women can drive. But for a long, long time, women couldn't even drive in Saudi Arabia. So these were the two things which were in my mind creating these pieces. And uh, I just decided to combine them. It made sense in my mind to combine them. And I also want to point out that the, on the, the right side, the green eyes are actually my own eyes. So I painted myself for this piece too. And I actually, uh, when the law was passed, uh, the very same year, which is over a year ago now, I actually went to Saudi Arabia and I drove a car there. And that was the car that a friend of mine was arrested driving the very same car. So, and I videotaped myself. So it was like, you know, making my work come alive and that, that made sense in my mind that I had to do it. 
so yeah i mean this work is very dear to my heart and you are very right that it is so strange that it seems even more relevant i was just recently thinking that france is still saying that no matter what everybody has to wear face mask they will still not allow religious mask <laughs> so <laughs> So I mean, how do you wow. differentiate what's religious and what's not religious? I don't know, but I was That's thinking. Right. About well, in your work, I mean, you're 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 out on the West Coast right now, but but you have a show so close to us and yet so far away because you're you have a beautiful show um, up right now at the Center for Art and Wood that Good. I hope that we'll all all be able to see one day soon. Yeah, that will be nice. I I hope things improve, but I mean. The most important thing right now is the safety of people. So that's right. I'm at peace with that. <laughs> Good. And and has your work been? I mean, have you been making work right now based out of of anything that happening with the Yeah, pandemic? I have an advantage. I have a studio at home, so my work schedule is pretty much same. I have a show coming up at Greg Cusera Gallery, which is opening in September, uh, Sacred Game. So I'm producing work for that. So I'm actively working. Uh, for me, there isn't a big change in my schedule, work schedule. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. Great words. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so then I also, you know, this it, this isn't a work in our permanent collection, um, but we were all talking about this new piece by the photographer Zanelli Muhali um, that was in the New York Times yesterday um, in an article about sort of artists in this moment, how are artists working in this moment? Um, and the arc of the article was so much about, um, you know, people talking about the work, either new work or recent work in the context of um, either having reduced resources, whether that's time and space, because uh, folks are living in places where there's mandated quarantine, um, or just the general reduction in resources. Um, we know artists are having a hard time getting access to their studios, to materials, um, whether that's about geographic restrictions or financial resources at the moment. Um, and it just also was kind of amazing to see um, Muhali's like really, I think gut-wrenching use of masks and gloves uh, in this piece. Um, we, um, Zanelli Muhali is, is an artist that uh, we at PAFA are familiar with um, in partnership with the, um, the Philly Photo Arts Center. Um, there was a residency program that featured Muhali mentoring 10 local women photographers uh, who created this incredible project called the Women's Mobile Museum, uh, which came to PAFA at the end of, I believe, 2018. Um, and they were all mentored by Muhali. And so you can see um, I think in this work, just why it is that there's there's a kind of uh, crackling energy in the arts around the the work that Mohali does right now. Not everything is self portrait photography, but this piece is, and I think it's incredibly powerful. And we do have a we do have a question for Humera. If it's okay, I don't know if we want to go back since we're 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 rolling with the questions as we yeah, go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, Robert is interested in the bruised left eye on tempting eyes. If you want to um, talk a little bit about that, Humera, if you would like to. Uh, I mean, my work is a lot about women issues, especially and social issues. So uh, I'm, I prefer to have layers in, of message in my work. I mean, the reason I took wood carving as my major and my main medium is because it's a male dominated medium. And I uh, try to bring women's voice uh, in the medium. Why bruised eye? Because uh, a lot of times uh, that's what women go through. I was watching a documentary. I think you can see it too. It's available online, Death of a Princess. And there are some other, other uh, documentaries too, which talk about uh, the situation of women, in, especially in Arab countries, Saudi Arabia. And um, I, then I was also watching, there was a video made by uh, two princesses in a kind of like a house arrest by their father because they were rebellious. So they were in house arrest for many years. And then one of the daughters uh, got married and actually got such a huge dowry. So I kept talk thinking about, you know, uh, why some women are being treated differently than others because, because when they are rebellious, they don't follow the rules and regulations in certain way. They actually have to face the consequences. So uh, it, this is again adding another layer of messaging that, you know, uh, what women are actually going through even though, uh, even after all the restrictions and boundaries around them. 
And certainly something that's heightened in this moment when we, when you see the statistics of domestic abuse yeah. right now with people trapped in their homes. Yes, exactly. So, I mean, these, the, I think this situation is also giving us insight into the situation for some people who in, in majority of the time live in these, these situations, how women are segregated, how uh, they are being restricted to do certain things. They can't do so many things. I mean, just recently I heard they're allowed to travel by themselves, but earlier they couldn't even travel without the permission of uh, the you know, male member of the house or without the company of a person. So there are so many restrictions if we read about them. So, I mean, a lot of people have been living with these restrictions for most of their life. Um, mm -hmm. And now we are realizing, you've, now we are talking about face masks and coverings and restrictions and mm -hmm. social distancing, whereas a lot of them have been living like this. That's absolutely right. Well, and, and part of it is also, um... With the Zanelli Moholy image, I was also thinking about this idea of women's work and how many artists, both male and female, are making work about masks or, frankly, making masks, right? Like, I, I feel like I've seen more men within the last, um, how many months have we been doing this? I guess three months? Uh, so, uh, than, than, than ever. Because um, there, there's always been that divide there. No, I agree. I also, I think it's really interesting that uh, so many artists are making masks. Um, artists who don't normally work in textiles or um, anything. I mean, just the, I've been really moved by uh, the ways makers in this moment have just sort of like adapted that impulse to, to make to the moment, whether that is making work about the moment or just like actually like making a useful mask like and donating it you know we've seen a lot of stories about artists making masks and donating them to various kinds of people we've seen a lot of fundraisers around um artists made masks i mean this this idea that art doesn't have um like necessarily like a useful structural function in our lives i think is really disintegrating right now i'm really pushing back against all those conversations i feel like this is such a moment where i've never been more aware of our our need for art and artists uh, regardless of what they're making um i know that there's there's a lot of dark humor and dark conversations around some of the art that we've been talking about today and about masks in general and about um, this pandemic, but I also wanted to um, take time to make space in the conversation for that work that is really moving um, and also kind of fun. Um, and so I saw all of these masks, these are available for purchase now online. And I, I thought like one, first of all, this is this is a great way to combine the conversation around mass and art. And it's also hilarious to think about, um, you know, this work by this adapting, you know, Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring or um, American Gothic uh, or the Mona Lisa um, to this moment where these, these art historical images that are so popular, we're used to seeing them in pop culture. Um, so these are like some of our most recognizable um, art works um, and what it looks like to put masks on them and put that on a mask. It's like mask exception or something. Um, I just I really was like so tickled by the Mona Lisa in gloves with hand sanitizer. I, I appreciate so much like a kind of humor in this moment. Um, and I also think humor and creativity are a great way to get through. Um, and so uh, Jody and I were talking earlier today about um, seeing, you know, on the left, uh, uh, an image of uh, attendees to the Brooklyn Museum's most recent uh, opening reception for their exhibition on Studio 54. Um, and the opening reception was um, right on the cusp of a lot of the shutdowns. Uh, and so for me, I was really amazed to see this photo of like, wow, so here are people who were really committed to getting to this opening reception that were really um, tapped into the subject matter. You know, these are, uh, I imagine like a museum, um, a museum staff's kind of dream audience, people who are so committed to the opening exhibition that they want to dress the part, but also in this moment where we were just starting to have these conversations around, oh, we all need to be self-isolating and distancing, um, that they they didn't stay home, they didn't opt not to see the exhibition um, or not to go to the reception to wait until we open back up again, they went wearing masks that were in the theme of the exhibition. So you have these masks that look like, you know, the, the mirrored disco balls, which is just kind of amazing. I don't know where you get these. Um, 
And this feels very much like a only in New York kind of whimsical thing to see. Uh, but then I also, there was a, a new story that I thought was really lovely about this woman who dressed in an inflatable hippo suit um, to visit her mother who was living in an assisted living facility. Um, and so when we were thinking about masking and covering um, as, as an index of care, this was like such a really lovely whimsical, artful, I think, way of um, both enacting care in a, in a kind of, you know, we need to social distance. Um, out, of my, out of my love and care for you, I want you to be in good health, um, but I also want to be near you. And so a compromise to work out, to put on a full-bodied sterile costume uh, to facilitate that interaction, it just, it feels like a kind of creativity um, that that is artful, um, and that's really lovely. And I think uh, I think I sent Jody like a YouTube video of this because I wasn't sure what the what the shared screen switching uh, was gonna do for us. So I'm gonna I'm, I'm also at the end of our slideshow, so I'm gonna stop the share right now. And if I could um, just open it up for conversation and I think we'll drop the link in the chat. Um, it's actually a really touching video. I feel like I've watched it four or five times and cried every time uh, because I also am like, oh, that's so creative and I want to hug my mom right now. <laughs> um, so that she figured out how to do it by putting on this, um, this, this costume is, is really lovely. Oh, thanks, Abby. But um, we were hoping that people would have some feedback around the larger conversation around maybe you're wearing masks um, or maybe you've purchased a mask or are selling masks um, from an artist. I, I just, we'd sort of just love to hear from you all on this. And we have a question from Anna already in the chat um, that I can read if you want about the mask on the mask on the artist's hair. Anna, maybe I could unmute you to adjust this one. Oh, sorry. Hold on one second. I think we're in a mute battle. There you go. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I was struck by the New York Times cover and the placement of um, the mask, not only on the mouth, but on the artist's hair. And I, was wondering, Brittany, um, I thought you might have some interesting observations about that. Um, yeah, uh, well, one, thank you for that. Uh, I have been thinking about how often, you know, we, we have seen in media these images of healthcare workers um, who are covering both their face and their heads um, and covering their hair. Um, and I think I've seen some conversation around um, like our unease with uh, what we know about how the coronavirus is um, spread through people. And, um, you know, we've been asked as a populace to wear masks in public, but we haven't been asked to cover our heads. Um, and, and I wonder if that's in conversation with the fact that um, there, there are some of us that are being asked to cover more of our bodies than others in this moment. Um, and so you are seeing um, not just nurses and, doc and, and doctors sort of covering their face and covering their hair, um, but people who work in various kinds of health environments in some assisted living facilities, um, some home health aides, um, some, some uh, therapists, there are all kinds of um, you know, professionals that we don't think of as frontline workers, but who do provide care for the physical health of other people, and they are covering both their, their mouths, their faces, and their heads. Um, and so I wonder if that's in conversation with that kind of, uh, with, that, with that practice that, that we aren't seeing as widespread. But I'm also wondering if that, um, if that might be a conversation that comes up for us later. It's uh, we know so little about the virus and, and what it means for our bodies that um, it's just interesting to think with an artist who's also thinking and worrying about that. I was also wondering if it was about race and in particular like covering her dreadlocks with this mask, this sort of desire not to be touched. Um, I, I don't know, I can't really put it into words, but I was, that's what the first thing that came up to my 
my mind when I saw that and I thought it was very effective to use the mask on her hair as in addition to her you know what bodies need to be protected what bodies need to be touched what bodies need to be legislated and there is a question from Lana um, or not a question, a statement, which is a, a really good point, I think, about, about Theodore's work. Uh, the upside down Capitol building and veto dreams is appropriate since the American flag displayed upside down is a signal of distress. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, that uh, in veto dreams that the Capitol upside down was the first, I've used that motif in other works since that piece. And um, that was the first one I used it in. And I never used the, I don't remember ever using the flag until I used the capital. So yes, and when I teach how to use um, these symbols as metaphors, allegories to uh, talk in a poetic way to talk about um, in a political sense with collage in particular, um, People forget that the flag and as a distress signal is something that we should do now, actually. Um, so yeah, that's a great point. And I've always read that image a little bit. And it's so interesting because I was just thinking of this as we were going through is that the last time, the last time I think the, the piece was up at PAPA was in the Happ Happiness Liberty Life exhibition that we did. Yes, it's one of two the, pieces. During the DNC, that's right, during, during the DNC during the Democratic right. National Convention. Right. Which boy, exactly. that seems like a whole nother time now. Um, yeah, exactly. But I've been looking at that image and thinking that that mask is just a, as much about silencing us um, as censorship or, or, or anything. I think when I look at that, I think mm -hmm. that's, you know, it's either, mm -hmm. it's either be quiet and do what we want you to do or, yeah. um, I don't know. Well, it's, it's so strange. We're in such an upside down world. We're protesting, yeah. I guess, so about not doing, you know, I don't know. I don't know how it's, it, yeah. especially with masks. I mean, yeah. that, that in itself is such a political symbol. I don't know if you saw the, the article in the New York Times about Nancy Pelosi. No. Um, and it, I thought it was going to be an article about her fashion, frankly, because you know, she's been matching the face masks with the dresses, oh. but, but the article made a good point. And this, this teaches us, there's always something that fashion can teach us, I think, but um, mm -hmm. that, that her making these very clear choices about wearing a mask and also being really um, careful in her choices about that is the complete opposite of what our president is doing and not making a mask. And how that in itself, like a mask now designates your political beliefs in a way when you go down the street. It, it, it's just such an interesting question um, that, and that your image I think brings all these different ideas to that. <laughs> Well, yeah, and what's really nice about it is the, you know, that it's the Capitol building that's upside down. I think there's a, there's a way the, the, our sort of cultural conversation about a world upside down is, um, like, I think it sort of transcends your, whatever your political affiliations actually are, because regardless of whether or not you um, sort of aligned yourself with the, with the sort of like the left or the right in terms of the government, they're, they're always, I think, um, for most of us in our lives, we've thought of um, at least these architectural symbols as symbols of order, um, as symbols of, you know, you had, yeah, you know, I've grown up in a, in a political system with a sense that people disagreed um, on a lot of approaches to, um, governance and, and political philosophy, but had a shared set of assumptions about just like the need for a management of information. Um, and this feels like a moment where even that is in flux, that you, you know, if you watch any kind of press conference with political officials, um, where you have um, elected officials, healthcare workers, um, sort of economic advisors all disagreeing sometimes and talking over each other or stepping over each other on television at a federal level, it's really unsettling to see so much disagreement. Like it really does feel like the Capitol building is upside down in a way that feels different than eight years ago or 15 years ago, or um, even in the, the ways I've, I've seen um, artists and, and scholars and other people sort of um, talk about, you know, the 60s and 70s, these times of political turmoil, there are things that seem to be at stake now that weren't at stake 
then. Um, it seems like opinions and philosophies were at stake then, but now people are arguing over whether or not a particular drug is necessary, whether or not a mask is necessary. It's, it's a different kind of scary. It's sort of nice to see those in conversation in that piece. And Mabel has a question, I'm gonna to try to, or a comment, I'm gonna to try to unmute you. There you are. Yeah, so I was really struck um, looking at Vito Dreams about thinking about why we know how to make masks, why so many people know how to make masks. And you know, I'd heard the conversation already about how particularly women who wear hijab have, are already wearing masks. But in looking at that question, I was thinking about things like people wearing masks because of wildfires and then thinking about people who wear masks because of tear gas. Yeah. So like there's this really interesting idea of why people wear masks that ties into so many of the different things, whether it's environmental and science issues or whether it's, you know, these other questions of, um, of protest and, and, and things like that, that really tie in really nicely. Yeah, I think Jody and I were talking about that um, in some of our conversations. Like we were talking about, you know, masks and protests, for example, the tear gas example, um, that, you know, that's an instance where um, a lot of folks coming together, when people come together in a protest or a demonstration and they're all wearing masks, that's like a, a sign of like community making and solidarity. There's a kind of, um, we all are engaged in a practice where we all want to protect our bodies um, from a kind of, from an environmental um, harm. Um, and so I think when folks show up in public uh, demonstrations wearing those masks, like there's a kind of we're all in this together energy um, that doesn't attach to some some of the other kinds of cultural meaning. I think we were talking about um, the Guy Fox masks that we see people wear uh, at demonstrations before this a little bit and the visuality of that. The reason that you see so many protesters wear that is a kind of like a throw back to like the history of protest and the idea that um, I want to show up in solidarity with a large number of people, uh, but I also recognize that I'm at risk um, in certain ways um, in terms of government surveillance. And so I'm, I'm not so afraid of being recognized in this space that I won't show up. Uh, my way of showing up is to show up and protect myself in this way. Um, so I do, I think that like there's so much rich cultural conversation and to be had across mass and all these pieces. Um, and the religious piece, I think, has a lot of resonance in Philadelphia, where you have like a sizable population of people who um, wear the hijab or niqab for various reasons. And so it's not, it's not that strange to see women wearing veils, um, just sort of out and about in Philly. And so it's interesting to think about, I think I saw somebody in a news story uh, say something about that, that actually now that everyone is being asked to cover up, we don't stand out that much. Um, by masking for religious reasons. And so that's even interesting that what it does that everybody's being asked to wear masks that some people who wear, um, who cover their faces or parts of their face all the time are like, well, now I'm actually a little more comfortable because everybody's a little bit covered. And I wanna just, there's a super interesting comment, um, David, David McKnight, which um, I don't call on people who don't have their video screens on, but I would love to, I would love to hear more about this comment. Uh, you know, masks and masculinity. Not wearing a mask can be perceived as, as do you, like um, as virile or stupid. So you're saying that uh, I'm 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 interpreting a little bit, but but that it that it could seem um, it's feminine to wear a mask to like sort of keep those rules. Hi, hi I, <clears throat> David McNutt here. Um, this, uh, I think the, uh, the <clears throat> President Trump sort of he uh, today he went to a Ford plant in Michigan. According to the news report, he wore a mask behind the scenes. Hmm. But when he spoke uh, to the press, he removed the mask. Uh, if you look at the way the protesters are um, in various states are behaving, the notion is, is that they are superior to the disease and therefore the mask is, can be perceived as effeminate or emasculate or whatever. Um, that's partly grain, ingrained in our brains, we males uh, of a certain type and age. So uh, that's my, my take on it. Yeah, I think that's super interesting, especially when you wow. think about the two sides and how yeah. that plays out between 
liberal, conservative, Republican, D Democrat, how you want to think about that as well. I think that's I a good point. Wear a mask. And Janet, if I can find you, you have your hand raised. Uh, there you are. Yeah. I'll un oh, you're good. Well, there you go. Somebody went to the masculine, feminine idea, um, you know, the, the intensity of the protests of men being told what they can do with their bodies or not, they're now being told they have to wear a mask, um, is uh, I saw a cartoon that compared it to women having been told what they can do with their bodies in so many different ways for so many years. Um, yeah, I wasn't going to bring it up, but since somebody did, um, that's another interesting uh, piece of the reaction to being told what they have to do. That's right. That's right. I, I saw that same thing and I, it was, it's, it really resonates actually. And it's funny because it's so much about how it looks and not about, not about the utility of it. I mean, um, to think about people who, you know, are, are wearing masks uh, in places where they need to until people start looking and then, and then this, um, this like very useful health tool like to remove it um, or to appear in public intentionally not wearing masks. It's sort of, it's sort of fascinating to think about the like very gendered implications of that. And somehow if you bring your automatic weapon, it's okay. <laughs> Right. That's the, right, that that's some people's preferred mode of protection, um, even though the mask is also a form of protection. Just, we're just really attached to visual symbols in this way. <laughs> we only have a few minutes left, so does anyone have any comments or questions or last minute thoughts? Want to share a mask that you have, a cool mask? No? Well, thank you, Brittany. And a special thank you to Hamera Abid joining us from the West Coast and Theodore Harris joining us from Philly. Thank you both for being here. It's like, it's a real thank pleasure you. to have your work in, in, your, in the collection. So thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. And yeah. everybody have a good evening and take good care. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank thanks you. Jody for being here. Thanks everybody. Please check out some more of our programs online and feel free to unmute yourself and say goodbye on your way out. It's been wonderful having you all here. Bye, Bye. Thank, Thank you. Good to see you. Hey, John. How are you, Swiss? Yeah. There's Brooke and Jay. Hi, Winston. I saw uh, you down yeah. there with your cigar. Winston. Hey, Brooke. Hey, Rob. Well. <laughs> Hi, Theodore. Hi, Danny. Hey. Danny Dawson. Yeah. Hi, Danny Dawson. That's good. Hi, yeah. Jody. Awesome. Nice to see New York in the house. Hey. Hey, John. Good job, Abby. This is mine. Nice. Yeah, there you go. Oh, nice, Abby. My friend made it for me because it looks like my print. That's beautiful. Very cool. That's great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye, John.